imaginary junction. And that imaginary junction is called ahamkara, false ego. False ego does not simply mean someone who speaks loudly and boisterously, always bragging about their accomplishments. How big is my car? How big is my house? How many houses do I have? No, false ego means anyone, rich or poor, who thinks, I am the body, the body belongs to me. And the world is meant for my gratification and my fulfillment. Real ego means, I am Krishna's eternal servant. The body belongs to Krishna. My senses belong to Krishna. I engage in devotional service according to Krishna's direction. That's the kind of ego we want. People get very disturbed by the ego so much so that they think the solution is to get rid of it. But no, the bhakti yogis want to purify the ego. So that instead of you're thinking, this is my body for my pleasure, you're thinking, this is, a, my body belongs to Krishna, it exists for his pleasure. In that way, in that kind of consciousness, even though we're in a material body, in the material world, then again we are aloof from the material body and the material world. Because the main reality that's going on is that we are serving Krishna according to Krishna's direction. So this is the mystery of bhakti yoga. Two persons can be businessmen, each trying to make money, but they can be on totally different, they can be in totally different dimensions even though externally they look the same. Because one businessman is thinking, it is my body, my wealth, and the other businessman is thinking, this is Krishna's body, Krishna's wealth. Externally, they look the same, just like Arjuna can look the same as any powerful warrior. But there is a universe of difference. Bhakti Yoga, Krishna Consciousness, is the art, science, and culture of how to be aloof from the material world completely while in the material world. The fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita teaches this to us. It's like a lotus leaf is untouched by the water even though it's sitting in the water. Similarly, we can be in this world but be totally aloof from karmic reactions. We have to look at what our mission is. So Narada Muni is convincing King Prachinavarisha, you are on a mission. You are performing karmic activity. Karmic activity means any activity in which we want to enjoy the fruits, the results. And what is the purpose of karmic or fruitive activity? It's twofold. How to deflect distress and grab happiness. But those are the two purposes of karmic activity. So when we see how we are acting, what we're striving for, then we can understand. Am I a karmic worker or am I performing non-reactive work? So the mystery of Bhagavad Gita is all about non-reactive work. Work done under the guidance of Krishna for Krishna's pleasure. From the outside, both look the same karmic activity and non-karmic activity. Just like from the outside, it looks the same when a cat is carrying her kitten in her mouth and when she's carrying a mouse in her mouth. They're both in the mouth of the cat, but 
the kitten and the mouse are feeling completely different experiences. The kitten is feeling the love of the mother cat, and the mouse is feeling the terror of death. So this is what bewilders those who don't understand Bhagavad Gita. How someone could be apparently dealing with so many material things and yet be totally detached because of their attachment to Krishna. Where someone could seem poverty stricken, have nothing, and yet be completely materialistic. So everything depends on your mission and your vision of yourself. So, Paranjana means the one who's trying to enjoy within the material body. And Narada Muni explained that our being Paranjana has a very long history. You can't get to the beginning of the history of our fruitive, karmic. Our history does not begin within the womb of the mother. Our history is long before that. And it will be long after our death in this body. Now, with the human form of life, it's our great opportunity to decide what our mission will be. Many of you who work for corporations know that generally corporations have mission statements. Maybe for FedEx it used to be, I don't know what it is now. On time, every time. Is still that? Yeah. Who has some corporate mission statement? Anyone? The city never sleeps. Huh? The city never sleeps. What's, the city never sleeps. What's that? Citibank. Citibank. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Pepsi has that mission statement to beat Coke. So, uh, what's the actual statement of their mission? Never mission. They said to compete to beat the competition. Uh, any other? Just do it. Yeah. Just do it. Is that their corporate statement or their advertising slogan? We want the corporate statement of mission. Of course, the mission of every Kali Yuga spirit soul is just do it. <laughs> Don't think about it. Google is don't be evil. Huh? Google is don't be evil. Google is don't be evil? That's their corporate mission statement. <laughs> so, what is our own mission statement? You're on a mission. I won't ask you that word. <laughs> but can you see that you have an individual mission statement, whether you have formulated it officially or not? What are you about? What are you trying to achieve? Obviously, you had some mission in mind, otherwise you wouldn't lift your head off the pillow in the morning. You lift your head up off the pillow in the morning to embark on a mission. What is it? And why? Narada Muni convinced King Prachina Barsha, you are on a mission. But he couldn't, or he chose not to directly instruct the king from the very beginning because kings have big egos and so Narada Muni decided to tell the king a story about someone like the king. He didn't mention any names in terms of directly identifying the king. But at the end of the several chapters of allegory, the king realized, this is me. <laughs> now this king was a very Vedic king. He understood good karma. He understood yajna, rituals 
for elevation to the heavenly planets. He had performed many yajyas. That was his thing. Good karma. Punya. He was far superior than the so-called materialists of today. When you call someone today a materialist, you're actually giving them too much credit. <laughs> because a genuine materialist is concerned, how can I be prosperous now and in the next birth? But the Kali Yuga materialist, so-called materialist, can't think beyond the present. I want to be happy now. I want my children and grandchildren to be happy. That's it. No further vision. <coughs> But a genuine materialist, such as King Prachinavarsha, understands. Here's the next life. What will be my situation in the next life? So in order to gain promotion to the heavenly planets, King Prachinavarsha performed many animal sacrifices. And, as you know, when in authorized Vedic yajyas, animals are sacrificed, they get elevation. Their situation in the next birth becomes much better. If the rituals proceed perfectly. But what Narada Muni is convincing the king is that you have done so many yajyas, there are going to be some mistakes some animals are going to be slaughtered and won't get promoted, and they are waiting on you. When you die, they will inflict reactions upon you. In other words, you're going to slip up in the path of good karma. This is why you read in the sixth canto Bhagavatam about the Yama Dudas discussion with the Vishnu Dudas. The Vishnu Dudas, the messengers of Lord Vishnu, challenge the Yama Dudas, the messengers of Lord Yamaraj. How can you justify your mission? Because the Yama Dudas were shocked. Ajamil was so sinful. Why are you, Vishnu Dudas, interfering with us, taking him to the court of Yamaraj? So the Vishnu Dudas told them, you don't know. What is real dharma? You don't understand your mission. And the Yamadudas protested, we know our mission. And they began to explain. The Yamadudas began to explain that actually everyone in the material existence will have the audience of the Yamadudas sooner or later. Because they pointed out, even if you try to perform good karma, there'll be some slip-ups. Maybe not in this life, but in the next life. And they assured that when you slip up, we'll be there for you. <laughs> they gave their mission statement. It's like, on time every time, we'll be there for you. <laughs> Maybe not this life. Maybe you're very good in this life. But maybe five lifetimes from now, sooner or later you're going to slip up in your karmic activity. Who is the king in, the, in Krishna Leela? Nirga? He gave so many cows in charity to Brahmanas. No one could count how many cows he gave in charity to Brahmanas. But somehow or other, he happened to give to one Brahmana some cows that he had already given to another Brahmana. And so that Brahmana was very incensed, very angry, and cursed the king. There's always some slip up on the path of karmic activity. Now, you don't have to perform Vedic rituals which of course in this day and age of Kali are ineffective. The only yajna, the only sacrifice that is effective in the age of Kali is kirtan, kirtanari the Krishna Mukta Sangha Param Vijay, hearing and chanting about Krishna.
You may try to be good in this life. Helping others, uplifting others, materially I'm talking about. But sooner or later, you'll cause some negative reactions because that's the way the world's constructed. Therefore, Krishna does not advocate the path of karmic activity. No acharya will recommend karmic activity. Because even when you try to be good, there will always be factors outside your control. Unexpected factors, unseen factors. You all had that experience. You did something never expecting that there would be certain consequences. Oh, if I had only known, I didn't foresee that. Right? Very frustrating. I tried to do good, my motives were good. But I could not have foreseen this. I was speaking at uh, universities in Colorado. University of Colorado, Colorado State University, Denver University. And at some of the places, I told about Albert Einstein's lamentation. He contributed so much to nuclear science. And then the atomic bombs were exploded over Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. And what was Albert Einstein's reaction? If I had only known this is what my scientific contribution would lead to, I would have become a locksmith, a key maker instead. It's like so many of you are working in IT. And then if your work, your labor goes to make an IT system that causes the world great damage, you lament so much. If I only known I was slaving in such a way that this would be the result. So that is the path of karmic activity. There's always regret about unforeseen circumstances because you can't see it all. This is one reason why Krishna urges us to drop the path of karmic activity. Karmic activity means actions in which we want to enjoy the fruits. We think it's my body, my mind, my possessions, my money. But change your mission statement and your whole existence can change. This is Krishna's body, Krishna's mind. My senses are meant for Krishna's satisfaction, to please Rishikesh. My wealth is meant. For Krishna, it's actually not my wealth, it is his. Bhagavatam urges us, Pranayartaya dhyya vacha. Your life, your wealth, your intelligence, your words, all those should be dedicated for Krishna's part. Then, your mission statement is different, the quality of your life is different. So this is the bhakti experience you can see the qualitative difference. You feel, you know the qualitative difference. Just by declaring as your mission statement, this body is meant for Krishna's pleasure. It belongs to Krishna. And we beg Krishna to please use us as his instrument. As we advance in bhakti, we naturally trust Krishna more and more. Just like so many of you. You accepted your parents' recommendation for marriage because you trusted your parents. What do the parents know? What do they got to do with my you know, Who I'm living with? Get real. They got their life, I've got mine. They can't understand the love and trust in a, a genuine Indian family in which the parents have cared so much for the children that the children, they, 
feel such a sense of love and obligation. All right, do you want me to marry this person? I will, because all my life you've all, always taken such nice care of me. You know best. But in the West, that's considered barbaric. <laughs> <laughs> Only you know what is best for your life. <laughs> so just as in a genuine Indian family, the trust the children have in the parents is so great. Similarly, we are all children of Krishna. Krishna says, he's the seed-giving father of all living entities. But where is our trust? Always very careful in dealing with Krishna, right? Don't let him get too close, right? <laughs> Keep him on the altar. <laughs> He's up there on the altar. Maybe, and then when the curtains close, when the gates close, the doors close, then we're safe. <laughs> we can get on with our plans, right? We can get on with our mission. One way, powerful way to stop that nonsense of simply thinking that Krishna is far from us and he's meant to receive our worship and that's all. One way to purify that misconception is by serving devotees, by seeing devotees as representing Krishna. Then gradually we elevate from being a Kanishta Adhika or your third class devotee, Prakrita Bhakta materialist devotee, we start moving up in our spiritual life. Because we can see not only the need for God, but we also see the need for God's devotees. So why is it that we have this fear of Krishna? As I said, so many of you didn't fear in terms of your parents taking care of you. And Krishna is the supreme parent of everyone. Yet we have this fear. We want distance. We even treat Krishna according to one saying, love at a distance. <laughs> yes, Krishna. We're developing love for you as long as you don't get too close, you stay away. There's some distance for our protection. In the seventh canto of Bhagavatam, you read about how the demons, the classic demons led by Hiranyaksha, Hiranyakashipu, they would accuse Vishnu of being whimsical. They actually accepted that Vishnu exists, but they said, He's so whimsical. He's like a little child. You can buy off the child just giving a sweet, a ladu or something. So Vishnu is like that. He should be equal to the demigods and the demons. But just because the demigods offer him some little bribe, Vishnu is on their side. So they accepted that there's Vishnu, but they felt... He's so fickle, he's so whimsical. He says, Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam. You can offer me leaf fruit, flower, water. And then he becomes totally partial to these devotees who offer him those things. He's so whimsical. They don't understand. They can also offer a leaf fruit, flower, water to Krishna. If it's done with bhakti, Krishna will accept. Krishna says, Samaham Sarabhuteshu. I'm equal to everyone. Everyone has a chance to engage in Krishna's service. So we have this fear due to our <laughs> demoniac tendencies. Actually, it's We have this fear that you just can't predict what Krishna is going to do to us, right? He can take everything away from us very easily, right? things we've worked so hard to get. Okay? We have this fear. You just don't know what Krishna's going to do. Even his very name, Hari. What does it mean? Hari. 
Huh? That's only half the meaning though. Just see, see how far? Everyone only remembers one half the coin. He who takes. No, the other half is he gives ecstatic love. He takes the material barriers away and he gives ecstatic love. That's the full meaning of Marie. But we're so paranoid, we only remember one half. <laughs> this is my point. Paranoia. So how are we going to get over this paranoia in dealing with Krishna? Sometimes if you see a devotee who's very sick, at the end of their life, and it looks like medically they're suffering so much, you wonder, Krishna, how could you let this happen? Right? Maybe you've had parents, relatives, who were Krishna bhaktas, yet they went through some intense medical situation. And naturally it makes you wonder, Krishna, how could you let this happen to your devotee? At times like that, we really have to understand Bhagavad Gita. That the material world and the material body are problematic. They are what they are. When Krishna says, when he has Arjuna declare, Kontiya Pratijani Name Bhakta Pranasati, Arjuna declared boldly, My devotee will never be vanquished. He's not talking about your material body, your material wealth, your material possessions. Those must be vanquished. But he's talking about your spiritual life, your devotional service, your existence as a devotee. So we're all influenced to varying degrees by a material conception of dharma in which we think the purpose of Krishna Bhakti is to improve our material prosperity. But material prosperity can't be improved for long. It must die out. It must collapse. So Krishna's promise, Arjuna declared boldly, my devotee will never be vanquished. Is about the devotee's spiritual wealth. So when we see a devotee undergoing a medical crisis, end of life crisis, we should try to see with higher vision how Krishna is actually nurturing and caring for that devotee. At first we may be put off balance. Oh, look at his condition. Look at her condition. Krishna, why? But then we have to get a grip on ourselves and learn to see the enormous wealth of care that Krishna is doing to that devotee. We can't get anywhere with external vision. So Bhagavad Gita trains us how to upgrade our vision so that we can actually see what is most important. Our vision is restricted by lifetimes of habit. We consider the external to be so important. We consider the external to be the symptom of Krishna's care. Look at my external packaging. That shows whether Krishna cares or not. Meanwhile, we forget that Krishna has told us in Bhagavad Gita, anicham asukam lokam. This temporary world is an unhappy place. We forget that. And we want Krishna to make it a happy place. Instead of dukkalayam, we want sukkalayam. Materially, that can't be done. But our mission is to do that. And remember, what are the two twin missions of karmic activity? To beat back distress and attract happiness. Elsewhere in the Bhagavatam, it's explained that that is the purpose of material relationships. A material relationship between husband and wife means together we will beat back distress together we will attract happiness more than what we could do individually. 
So the Shastra describes that two persons decide to share their life together. What does that mean? It means walking up a mountain barefoot and the mountain is covered with sharp stones. So that is a material relationship. You try to walk up a mountain whose side is covered with sharp stones and you have bare feet, it'll be quite an ordeal. What Bhagavad Gita is teaching us is not to drop all activities, but to attach all activities to Krishna's pleasure and make an effort to find out what Krishna wants the most. Then we can start to get a vision of what is love of Krishna. Once we start learning to take Krishna's concerns as foremost, just as Arjuna finally did. And at the end of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna said, Nashtamo smitir labda karishye bhajanantala. Krishna, my illusion is now gone. I will act according to your words. That means he's not in the material world. Srila Prabhupada was once speaking in Melbourne, Australia, and he explained that as soon as you make the decision that I am living for Krishna's pleasure and you act in that way, you are not in the material world anymore, whether you know it or not. You can change your existential situation, not by geographical movements, but by changing your mission. When your mission changes from living for my pleasure to living for Krishna's pleasure, your location changes. The spiritual location cannot be detected by your GPS system. <laughs> this kind of change of location, you know, no material device can measure. When you simply decide, I want to live for Krishna's pleasure. It's his body. My body is actually his. My property is his. I want to live for his satisfaction. As soon as you decide that and act in that way, you are not in the material world, whether you recognize it or not. You may not recognize it at first. Just like these little children. They don't recognize the fullness of their circumstances yet. They will grow into it. Similarly, by Engaging in Krishna's service with the recognition that Krishna is the enjoyer. We are no longer in the material world and gradually we'll become aware of that. Just like gradually these children, they'll become aware that they can listen in this, in this lecture. They can be here and benefit. Gradually they'll learn. Right now they don't have a clue. <coughs> what are the little kids thinking? Maybe some mother can tell. What are the little kids thinking? Why are all these grown-ups sitting on the floor? Why don't they play? <laughs> they need some toy trucks. They need some dolls. Oh, they, they look so serious sitting in the chairs. Is this what it means to grow up? <laughs> That's what they think. But gradually they will grow into awareness of why their parents are participating in hearing and chanting about Krishna. And similarly, gradually, once we make that decision, I exist for Krishna's enjoyment. Everything I have, I don't have, it belongs to Krishna. Gradually we'll become aware that that stance, that lifestyle, puts us in the spiritual world. So therefore, when Srila Prabhupada explained this point, he said, this is not Melbourne, this is Vaikuntha. And he went on, this is Vrindavan. When your life is characterized by dedicating everything for Krishna's play, 
Shila Bhakti Vinod Thakur demonstrated the maximum efficacy, the maximum potency of spiritual lifestyle transformation. He describes that in his song, Shuddha Bhakata Charanarenu. He said he was performing arti one day in his home and he saw the whole house transformed into Goloka Vrindavan. <laughs> so that's the peak potential. <laughs> We have to begin somewhere. Therefore, change the mission statement. And then you'll give Krishna a chance. First, start trying to detect what is your mission statement? What, what's driving you on or what do you want? Well, I just want to feel comfortable. I just want some rest. Some peace some happiness, some love. Whatever it is, try to dig it out from under the ground and see it, analyze it. And decide, is this mission statement what Krishna wants? How to make our mission statement what Krishna wants? That is the bhakti quest. All right. Any questions? Yes. Um, you were saying that um, it's good when you uh, do not think about your own pleasure and you think about what Krishna wants. Yes. How do you know what Krishna wants? He says in Bhagavad Gita, general instructions for everyone, Satatam Kirtayam Tomam, always chanting my glories, engaging in my devotional service with determination. Manmana Bhagavad to always think of me, become my devotee. And then Krishna sends you his representative to teach you how to please Krishna, how to see what Krishna wants. Krishna says, Sarvadhanam Prachaja, Mamekam Sharanam Braja. Abandon all your ideas of what is Dharma and just take the real Dharma. What is real Dharma? Whatever Krishna wants. That same Krishna comes as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he gives the same order as Krishna does in Bhagavad Gita. How does Chaitanya Mahaprabhu do that? What does he say? Yare teko tare koho krishna upadesh ama agya guru hoi tare desh Wherever you go, whoever you meet, teach the science of Krishna. That's Krishna saying the same thing. As surrender to me. So when we take up that order of Sri Tathani Mahaprabhu, we are surrendering to Krishna's instruction at the end of Bhagavad Gita. So, wherever you go, whoever you meet, teach them the science of Krishna. <laughs> Prahlad did it with his five-year-old schoolmates, you know? <laughs> Anything else? Yes! Maharaj, what are the best ways to intensify the work on service that would be a faster, we would approach quicker to Sharmakati level? Focus on attentive chanting and then focus on attentively giving Krishna to others. Approach Krishna through Krishna as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Otherwise Krishna is difficult. But that same Krishna comes as Lord Chaitanya and makes everything easy. Therefore, Chaitanya Charitamrita says, for one who remembers Lord Chaitanya, difficult things become easy. And for one who forgets Lord Chaitanya, easy. There is the saving grace in Kali Yuga, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The more the Panchatattva dance, the more easy it is to taste love of Krishna. And the Panchatattva are always dancing. So it's always getting easier to taste love of Krishna. <laughs> yeah.
How did you develop trust in your parents? Okay, so live with Krishna. <laughs> That's the bhakti lifestyle, living with Krishna. <laughs> You saw that your parents always acted for your welfare, right? Even when they punished you. Of course, you probably never punished, right? <laughs> Gradually, you realized when they so-called punished you that they were simply acting for your future benefit. You can probably think of some times when you but why are your parents restricting you about this or that? And then later you realize, ah. Oh. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Harmonizing uh, in Krishna service, sometimes the mind is very unsteady. Sometimes? Oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, chanting, where you always think of so many different things. And so, how, maybe just give us some realizations how to help us. How many years of higher education did you do? A little bit of college. Hmm? Some college. Uh -huh. yeah. But all in all, how many years in school in your life? 20 years. Okay, so can we spend 20 years trying to chant Hare Krishna with attention? <laughs> Such a short time. You know, our life is so short. But we have it in our mind. Try to see now. We have it in our mind that we have a long life. Isn't that true? What do the sages of Naima Sharanya say? Prayana, Pajap, Sabya, Kalavas, Bin, Yugajana. In the age of Kali, everyone is short lived. But do you feel like you're short lived? No! I have so much time ahead of me. But to spend 20 years trying to hear Hare Krishna. <sighs> Can't do that. <laughs> Such a short time. <laughs> Krishna appreciates our efforts to hear his name. He's not hard-hearted. Any ordinary human being, if you made an effort to attentively hear them, they will feel grateful, right? You are a married man? So, when you make an effort to hear, listen to your wife? Sometimes. <laughs> well, we know what happens if you don't. <laughs> I haven't explained for some years, but maybe 10 or 15 years ago when I, when I would give class or speak in Los Angeles, I would explain what American psychologists have said are the two words married men fear the most to hear from their wife. Let's talk. <laughs> Because the man doesn't know what's coming next. It's like, oh, no. She wants another baby, or she wants a, a bigger house, or she wants a divorce. So, so the psychologists recommend to the wife that you never say just let's talk, because the man just ah. you say let's talk for ten minutes about such and such. And then the man will oh, okay. <laughs> So when someone does talk and you listen, that person appreciates. So 
why shouldn't Krishna appreciate the supreme person? Why shouldn't he appreciate your efforts to chant his name with attention? We have this image in our mind that Krishna is so hard-hearted and cruel on us, unattainable. Meanwhile, Lord Titania is saying, Krishna is giving himself away in Kali Yuga. So we have some programming problems in our mind, you know? That's why it's so important to read the Shastra so that our intelligence becomes purified because we've got a lot of crazy notions picked up over many lifetimes. Shall we have some kirtan and then prasad? Okay. We have a Madonna play. Let's see if you know this too. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Krishna, 